I'm Michael Vespezio, and welcome to the Science of Decision Making. I've been a science educator for over 20 years, and during that time, I've observed a significant shift in our teaching emphasis from a content-intense curriculum to a teaching framework in which our students construct an understanding as they learn how to apply science content. The National Science Education Standards describe this as a shift in focus from knowledge to understanding. It's also one in which we seek to provide an environment which encourages active participation by students as opposed to their passive acceptance of facts. Okay, enough pedagogy. It's time for you to observe this informal, and I stress informal, workshop in which these teachers will operationally define an understanding of the decision-making process and how best to convey this to their students. Welcome, everyone. Decision-making, it's a pretty new topic in a way to be introducing that into science classrooms. However, one begins to ask why do people begin to talk about decision making? This morning I looked through the newspaper and there were a number of different articles in there. Most of them, many of them, pertained to science and decisions which need technology science background. There were articles about global warming. There were articles about the internet. There were articles about medical technology. There was even an ad in the newspaper which talked about a special type of personal cooling system. You put these goggles on when it's real hot outside and it cools you down. Uh, interesting concept. When you look at the goggles, they say you need to pour some water into there because there's some electronic thing which goes on and then that produces the cooling effect. But what is happening is probably the same type of evaporant cooling that bees do. You know that when bees get hot inside their little hive, what they wind up doing is putting drops of water in there, getting a whole bunch of bees together and, and doing bee stuff by shooting streams of air through the hive. What that air tends to do is help in the evaporation of the water. As the water droplets evaporate, they carry with them heat and you cool the hive, a type of real primitive air conditioning. Now, one looks at these goggles and, wow, what a great deal for only $49. However, I begin to remember back doing some hiking in the Grand Canyon when, when there were a number of people wearing a similar type of goggle prototype. And what it consisted of was a bandana that was wet in water. And putting it on themselves, they were able to have the evaporant cooling cool themselves off. Again, what does all this mean? Well, it means that our students need to become critical decision makers. They need to look and try and understand what these concepts in science and technology are and how they relate to their own lives. Another reason why we're looking at decision making is let's look at big business. Big business begins to set down certain needs that they need in looking at certain individuals coming to them for employment. No longer are they looking at heavy duty scores in aptitude tests, but now many of them seem to be focusing on higher thinking skills. They're looking at decision making, they're looking at critical thinking, they're looking at creativity as main qualities which drive employment. And finally we get to the National Science Education Standards. In this document a scientifically literate student is described and this student becomes a valid informed decision maker at both the civic and the personal level. And so we strive to have students construct this understanding, which is a functional knowledge, that they're able to become wise decision makers in their own life. Now, today's workshop will be based on activities which are available in decisions based on science. This is a National Science Teacher Association publication, which describes how one can use and integrate decision making skills in the regular science curriculum. The book itself is divided up into three parts. The first part talks more about the pedagogy of decision making. What is the decision making process? What are the steps involved in making an informed decision? The second part of the book uses teacher guided activities where there are readings which are accompanied by certain types of activities and you'll be doing one of those later. Uh, and then the students must make a decision based upon their experience. The third part are student activity pages which give a background information to a certain decision. I'll also suggest other sources of information such as the internet, such as additional readings, um, and other areas in which a student might become well informed in the decision making process. Decisions, decisions, decisions. We all seem to be making them, uh, and we've all made different decisions, and, and most of us have made a significant life decision. Teaching. 
We've become teachers. Why have we become teachers? Why has anyone here become a teacher? Loja, <laughs> <laughs> why did you become a teacher? Um, initially, it was to be able to spend more time with my family, but, and that's being honest, but now I realize that it was uh, probably one of those things that I want to be able to reach out and touch people's lives and make a difference for some, some of the children in our world and make a difference in our world. So you went in for making a distance, not for making the big bucks. Right. No. no, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah. It wasn't the money. It wasn't the money. You, you, you showed me the money, so it wasn't the money. <laughs> so it, it, it's a major life. Now, was it an easy decision to make? Uh, at that particular point in my life, yes, it was. I'm a relatively new teacher, so I'm rather older and had time to think about some of the things I wanted to do. So. Okay, so you did think about other things. You did sure. think about certain types of options sure. that you could do. However, this seemed to fit more of the goal of what you wanted to do. Yes, yeah. Somebody else, what's another reason someone has gone into teaching? Think back. Yeah, Linda. I didn't want to grow up. And so I figured that was a legitimate way to make a living and still be able to find answers to questions I had as an adult. And so I like to find answers with my students. And it's, it's just, you know, if I ever grow up, I'll probably retire, though, before I grow up. And then I'll have to get a real job. But I think it's more fun. Excellent. Being with, and you stay young, even though I don't look it. You stay young doing that because children make you stay young. Oh, you do. And what, and what grade do you teach? On a good day, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade science. 6th, 7th, and 8th. What, what a great thing to remain as a child. 6th, yeah. 7th, and 8th grade. And anybody that's been in the 8th grade, I think, yeah. tends to know it. I, I wound up teaching 8th grade for 10 years. And either you love that age or you hate that age because they are wired. But they're also mm -hmm. a real innocent age in which you're yeah. able to really bring them out of their shells to have a real fair-based, open view to become a critical thinker and to become a good decision maker. So those are excellent grades to start bringing in a lot of these decision making skills. Okay, and looking at decisions, all of us here were able to make a certain decision. Let's take a look at one, and let's take a look at how we begin to apply that. Ah, here we are, and it works. There's a certain situation. During a school break, a session on decision making is offered. Okay, so there you are, you're a teacher, and you have this window of opportunity which opens up. And the window of opportunity is that there is a session which is offered on decision making. Well, let's take a look at your life. If one goes back and looks at certain things, you'll notice that you're driven by certain goals. And one of the goals may be to learn more about decision making, which would be a fair goal. Another goal a teacher might have is to celebrate your time away from school. So now you have a certain window which opens up, and you have two possible goals that you may attain. You may learn more about decision making, and you may also celebrate your time away from school. Now, in decision making, you're able to lay out these goals and the options which you have in certain types of charts, in certain types of matrices. And the first one looks something like this. It is a fairly simple matrix which lists the goals on one side of the boxes. And then you have the two goals that we've just talked about. Goal one is to learn about decision making. Goal two is to have fun. Well, what happens? Well, we've got two options we can look at. One option is to attend the session, as all of you here have selected to do. Uh, the people that are not here in the session are probably going for option number two, which is to go for a Zydeco band, which is playing down the street, and to listen, listen to that. So we have two possible options with your free time. You can either attend the session or go for Zydeco. What happens with a grid such as this is that you're able to explore the options in depth because decision making is not a superficial yes, no, this is right, this is wrong. There's much more to it. There's much more content. In fact, if we look at this first concept, this first goal of learning, if we attend the session, what will happen? Will we learn? Anyone? Hopefully, all right, so we're going to put that, hopefully I'm not a quack, okay? Hopefully we'll, we'll learn about decision making. Decision making. What else? We'll learn about decision making. Is there anything else that you learn? Are there other concepts in learning? Anything in style? Anything in presentation? New ideas. New ideas. So there, there's new ideas that we can bring in. Will they all relate to decision making? What do you mean by that? 
how to present an idea in a classroom. How to present so you can learn things other than the content, but you can learn style. So we can learn new ideas, and we can also learn style. And you can also learn how difficult it is to write with a stylus <laughs> and try and look like you're intelligent on, on a screen like that. Um, so we have now hopefully learned. How about having fun if you're attending the session? Before coming here today, did you think this was going to be fun? No, it was probably not going to be fun. Thanks, thanks. It was not going to be fun. So have fun. We'll, we'll give a maybe. We'll have fun. We'll put hopefully. Oh, look at that. Hopefully comes up twice. One thing about, about that is you teach uh, students in coming to a group like this, you get to interact with other adults. And so, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a refreshing change to go and interact with other adults and other teachers. Excellent. And we might have another goal in here listed as celebrating being a teacher, which is a very important concept. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the greatest places to celebrate it is with other teachers outside of the school environment. Yeah. And where you begin to examine why you've become a teacher. It is the most noble of professions. I, I believe that deep, deep, <laughs> deep inside, that teaching is, is an unbelievable gift. Uh, and, and I feel that, that you know, it is a goal in people maybe to achieve that feeling of self-worth, that feeling of self-satisfaction within a job. And maybe attending this session helps you achieve that. Let's take a look at the other option that we had here. Another option was learning. Uh, if we went for Zydeco, if we went to go listen to some band that was playing down, down the block, down the street, <laughs> would we learn? Sure. Sure. Oh, what would we learn? Dancing. Yeah, we'd learn dancing, okay? We'd learn how to, how to dance. What else might we learn? You might learn something about the culture. Might some, learn something about the culture. Bon temps rolé. So we've got a little bit of stuff in here. So we've got some culture stuff. I'm, I'll put a, a rub board in here. Does that make sense? You know? <laughs> so we've got this. I'm getting a little bit better with this pen as we go along. Uh, so we'd learn about the dance, we'd, we'd learn about culture. Would we learn about decision making? You might. Yeah. Sure. Ah, you, I might. You, but, but it's not a session on decision making, no. yet you're telling me I might learn about it? Julie? No, well, I had to make a decision before I went. So if I thought about the process that I went through before I made my decision, I'm learning about decision making. So you're making the, learning about decision making before going to the session. What about at the session itself? Would you yeah. be learning about decision making there? Would you be experiencing it? Sure. In, in what ways? Behavior, your actions. Things Behavior, your actions. So you're constantly you like making these yeah, decisions. Like so even though this option for going for Zydeco may not be one which fully celebrates decision making within the classroom, it's one which still gives you the opportunity to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. What about having fun? Definitely. Yeah. Def oh, there was a definitely. <laughs> That's the only def Fine. I get only hopefully on having fun and hopefully on learning. Zydeco yeah. gets definitely. <laughs> On having fun. In fact, that, that rates a big smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is one way of presenting decision making. So it's decision making using this type of grid, which shows goals along one axis and the options along other axes. Now, let's take a look at developing this a little bit further. Summertime. Summertime's a great time. People are not in the classroom, and generally when teachers are not in the classroom, they have certain goals and which things that they would like to attain during their summer hours. What's one of those goals? During the summer, what would you like to do? Relax. Relax. Wow, relax. All right. So we have right here, we've got a goal of relaxing here. What's another goal for the summer? You're a teacher. What, if, what do most teachers do during the summer? Recharge. Yeah, they recharge. recharge. Relax. Anything else? Plan. 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 They plan. Yeah, we they plan. All right. Plan so the, another plan. goal here, actually we can put goal over here is in planning. Anything else? When you're out of the classroom, anybody here shift gears with summer jobs, different mm -hmm. types of things to do? Anybody have different areas of making? I, I just try to do something in the house that I don't have time for, like painting a room. Oh, wow. Or, so we've got something catch up on that. chores or something, yeah. catch up on your life? So, yeah. yeah. I want to get yeah. clean closets. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a number of different 
goals. If we begin to look at our options, obviously we will have a number of options to do with our summer. What are some of the things we can do with the summer? What's one thing people like to do during Travel. summertime? Travel. Travel. Okay, so we've got another option here. Let's say option X is travel. Again, what we have is that same type of grid developing. Do we relax when we travel? Sometimes. Anybody here travel with kids? <laughs> I've got an 11-year-old. It's kind of a very interesting relaxing vacation. Oh, Dad, Dad, you've got to get up and relax. You've got to get up and relax. Um, interesting concept. Do we relax? Hopefully. Let's put a hopefully on this one. A lot. A lot. We have plenty. We've got a whole bunch of relaxing things. What about traveling? Does that help in planning oh, next yeah. year's curriculum? Yeah. 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 It does. It gives yeah. kind of that separation space. So we can find out that, yeah, we have an option which this succeeds at. What about catching up on life? Is it a good thing for getting back on chores if you're traveling? No. no. Probably no. not. <laughs> Most likely not. Yeah. But Maybe again, I'm not giving this definites. It's very important that one does not give definites to most decision-making things because things change. Even when you begin to evaluate the worth of something, that is a changeable scale when something else comes up. Boy, I broke my leg, and it's terrible that I'm limping around. It's real terrible until I see somebody that's broken two legs. Then all of a sudden, my degree of worth on that shrinks down. So it's all concepts that one is able to look. In this chart, by the way, notice that I have two options, travel or What's the other one? If we didn't want to travel, what could we do? Stay home. Stay at home? Stay home. <laughs> work. 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 We could stay. Ah, so you're telling me we can work. Work might Absolutely. be then our third option. In fact, what happens is often you have many options coming up. Mm -hmm. So we would have travel. We would have stay at home. Mm -hmm. We would have work. In this case, stay at home was almost a do nothing in the decision concept. Often in the decision-making process, one of your options is to do nothing, is to not go. You have to select A or B. Well, how about I select neither and go back to sleep? Turns out to be often a viable option. And in fact, in the decision-making process, it is often the option many people select. OK, so one form of looking at decision-making is using this type of grid. Pretty standard, pretty easy, I think, for the kids to look at. There's another thing and another type of way of visually representing decision making. And I'll give you a little bit of background on, on this one. It's called manage the fisheries. People are very worried now about the state of marine resources. You go up and down the East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, go to the West Coast. There are very high concerns, very important concerns on what is going on with the fisheries. If we look at post-World War II, at that time we had a rise in the fishing catch. The 70s and 80s, that rise began to plateau. By 1983, it began falling. We began overfishing, overusing this resource. In Alaska, during the 1980s, the number of trawlers increased fivefold. If we look at something, well, closer, closer to home, I live up on Cape Cod, an area where, where many sawfish are captured. And I noticed last night, in fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about food because we had some great food last night. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is going to influence some, some, some of the discussion now. Um, but on Cape Cod, where they go out for swordfish, when I first got up there 20 years ago, it would normally take a sword fishing boat one week to go out, get enough swordfish to make the journey worthwhile, then come back to port. Now those same boats go out for three weeks, maybe even four weeks at a time, mm -hmm. which is an incredible change in just 20 years. Now, something to consider. People like to make a decision and buy fresh fish. When that boat goes out and leaves Cape Cod on a three- or a four-week journey, that boat can get a swordfish two days later. What happens to that mm -hmm. swordfish? It goes on ice. It goes on ice for how long? Three and a half weeks. So the fresh swordfish, which is here it goes, off the boat, is three and a half weeks old. Now, when that swordfish arrives on Cape Cod, we can go and buy fresh swordfish, which is only, you know, three and a half weeks old. If that same swordfish is shipped out to the Midwest, well, I don't want to have fish in the Midwest. The fish isn't fresh. It's maybe only another eight hours old. Again, a concept in decision making. OK, so now let's get back to managing these fisheries. If we look at the fisheries, we have a certain number of goals. And these goals have to be addressed at both the personal and the civic level. Say we are all working in government. 
what is one of the things that we would like to do with fisheries? What is one of the goals? If we were going to manage, why would we manage the fisheries? What is one thing we want to do? To avoid exploitation, overfishing. To avoid overfishing. OK, excellent. So one of the things that we would do is establish some sort of rules, some sort of guidelines, so that we would not overfish our stocks. All right, you're in government. You want to make everybody happy. What's another thing that you want to do when you manage fisheries? Make so, it economically viable. You want to keep it economically viable. You want to save jobs. You want to keep jobs around so people who are in the fishing industry remain in the fishing industry. Right now, I believe we lose about 10,000 jobs in the fishing industry per year in the States. That is probably changing. But it is an incredible amount of work force which is now being redirected. If you go further up the northeast coast up to Newfoundland, Newfoundland and actually to Nova Scotia even is a, is a much better example. 20 years ago, Nova Scotia was an incredible fishing place. Incredible number of trawlers that would go out to the Grand Banks and fish. Right now, the fishing has pretty much fallen apart there. And they're shifting the whole economic base to tourism, not fishing. Incredible concepts of what happens when you overfish an area. OK, so we, we want to save jobs. We would also like to stop overproduction. What about um, the recreational fishing? Anything that we want to do? Fishing. You have to have rules for them so that basically you know, they can catch a certain number of fish because they don't use nets and that kind of stuff. But they, and they also have the size limits now where you can't take the smaller fish. You can only take fish over 14 inches or something like that. So uh, you know, and they've set limits. They adjust them regularly. Uh, you've got to have a fishing license. I got you. So, so we're looking then now, we're adding the management of recreational fishing and basically keeping it up and keeping it available for individuals to go out and, and do fishing. Any, any other things in managing fisheries that, that, that people want to do? Yeah? Well, the culture of the area, so let's say if it's in an area where Native Americans are, people who make a living, they have a, uh, might have a certain culture that you want to maintain and not infringe upon. Excellent. Sure. So you're looking at a whole bunch of things like how do you keep cultural stability? And how do you prevent changes from occurring, which in fact can in some ways damage a culture, damage a society, damage an impression of a certain culture? OK, so in managing the fisheries, we have goals and we have certain options. Well, let's take a look at various types of goals. And the, these are mostly the ones that you said. Prevent overfishing of commercial stock, save jobs, offer unrestricted, or this would be restricted, but managed recreational fishing. And also, another goal is to reduce the government intervention. Get the government out. Hey, we can self-manage, or can we? Interesting concepts when you begin looking at the fishing that has occurred off the northeast coast. Um, years ago, it went to self-management, which was real questionable of what had happened there. Could it self-govern? Could it not self-govern? Again, the jury is still out on a lot of this, but you have many different types of concepts which this all ties into. What I'd like to tie it into right now is something called importance bars. We discussed before about the use of the grid in looking at decisions. Importance bars are a way of looking at and evaluating goals. Each of these goals has a certain importance. Some of us may see one more important than the others. What I'd like you to do right now is to work with your group that's at your table and to decide which of these are the most important, which is the least important, which is of lesser importance, and finally, which is the least important out of all four. So why don't you communicate now? Because communication is a very important part of decision making. Talk with your partner or partners and see if you can come up with a hierarchy of importance for these goals. Right now, I mean, who else is going to maintain this? Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you have so much poaching. That's, that's a big issue in our area. We went to Personally, I think yeah. the government wants to Yeah. I know I may be cutting some of you short here, but what I would like to do is just get a little bit of feedback from several of the groups. Catherine and Pat, you've come up obviously with a hierarchy here. Yes. And what, what do you decide, looking at all of these importance bars, which is the most important in, in your view? We decided 
to leave it as is, that uh, prevent overfishing was the most important because if you uh, depleted your stock, if you depleted the fish, then there would be no jobs, there would be no recreational opportunities, and there'd be nothing to manage or intervene. Okay, so, so I'm going to stop you right there. Source. Prevent overfishing, you believe, is, is the most important most of the important. goals. Anybody else agree with that? Just a show of hands. Anybody not agree? Okay, so it's science teachers. So we're looking, we're looking at this. Had I been doing this with ec economics teachers and sociology, we might find that government intervention was the most important thing. Um, okay, so that's number one. Catherine, if you can continue, please. What was the second most important one you found? We chose to save the jobs as being the second most important because that would provide money for recreation. Okay. And, um, and we thought that if you had jobs, if there was a fishing industry, then again, there would be something for the government to mediate or intervene. So we left that as is. Okay, anyone not choose that as their second option? You did not. <laughs> Sandy, why not? We went with the unrestricted recreational fishing. Unrestricted. But instead of unrestricted, we went with rest restricted instead. Restricted? Yes. Right. And why did you feel that? Why did you feel that that, that was an important? an important concept to look at. We didn't at. discuss so we kind that. Of, we kind of just got <laughs> I think part of it yeah. being that a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of jobs in the recreational fishing industry. And right. so in retrospect, you are still saving jobs by allowing that area of importance to be, uh, to be over that. Also, uh, if you're going to have a s relationship between industry and recreation, then there has to be some consideration for them and not put them at the bottom of the list. They kind of keep getting, and, and especially mm -hmm. if you're a recreational fisherman, I think we all fish, so. <laughs> Excellent. And, and there's also retooling, which occurs in the job. So if one is out of one job area, they're moving into another. As before, when I discussed with Nova Scotia, seems to be moving from fishing then to tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, one has to look at this with a critical, critical mind and actual critical analysis to what is really working, what is not working. Uh, and for the, the last one, I guess it was reduced government intervention. Is, it, is that basically on everyone's list here? Or should that be higher up there? And again, I am not placing any value on that. That might be number one. Maybe the government should, has no business in this whatsoever. All right, now how do we use importance bars? How important is preventing overfishing of commercial stock? On a scale of one to 10, and let's assume that that black line there This black line over here represents 1 to 10. On a scale of 1 to 10, how important is preventing overfishing of commercial stock? Do you think it's 9 or 10? OK, we're, we're placing this all the way up at 10. OK, so it would go all the way from there to all the way over here. So this is overfishing, number one. Actually, this is, this is good, number one. How important is saving jobs compared to the 10 that we give to Preventing overfishing. Is it also a 10? Is it as important? Is it half as important? Is it less than half important? Is a little bit more? Do you see what I'm getting at? You're able now to look at these things and understand that you've got this wide latitude of what your possible answer is. What, what would we say um, to Jetta? What, if you had to give it a number from 1 to 10, how important might you think that saving jobs would be? Eight. <laughs> Eight or nine. Eight or nine, okay. Now remember, you're also, once you give this an eight or nine, so this is over here, so now we're going all the way up, that's about eight or nine right mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. This is where jobs are, so we have jobs being, being this important. In relation to jobs, in relation to preventing overfishing, how important is managing recreational fishing? Is that as important as saving jobs? Yeah. Will this vary if we go from group to group? Yep. If we go from individual to individual? If we go along the tier from individual to government, local government, to state government, to national government, to a whole world concept, does this change? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah most likely yeah. it does. But in your world right now, how important would be offering managed recreational fishing? Is that something? That would be eight or nine. You think it would be up at eight or nine where jobs are? Okay. Eight or nine. But it really does more than provide, just provide jobs because it actually gets that interaction between the environment and the individual. So that appreciation for that nature and that, yeah. that type of environment becomes more, uh, more personal. And I think then that's where the government intervention question can come into play.
That's, that's excellent. Because if, if you begin to look at people's awareness of science and awareness of what is going on there, that influences funding into science. Mm -hmm. And another important thing about learning about science processes, about learning about the decision-making process, is that in doing so, one becomes more aware of what is out there, and then one becomes a wiser decision when they're making certain decisions on, well, should funds go towards cancer research? Should funds go in this other area? Should funds go towards protecting our fishing stocks? So again, what this tends to do is that it tends to increase general awareness, which in this case is giving you more of an appreciation for understanding the natural structure of the environment. So we're, we're back up there at eights with both of those. What about reducing government intervention? How important do you think that is? <laughs> is, it, is it important? Sure. Yeah. Lee, tell me about what, what, explain that a little bit. Because we got into a little discussion on, it depends on where you are, who you, what group you're speaking to, or what cross-section of groups you're speaking to. If I'm a, a commercial fisherman, I'm against, I'm for reducing government. I'm against the TED net, because I'm, correct that. But if I'm a recreational fisherman, I'm, I want you to continue to, to, to regulate. And, and in fact, often what you're doing with importance bars in this, you define a certain role for each student within the group. So you would be an individual. You would be an elected official. You would be a conservative, somebody that, that works in conservation of, of local um, forests. And then you would begin to talk about how this importance bars are really set up within your own personal goal system. Is it that important? Obviously, there's going to be different importance for different people. Again, this is critical in developing critical thinking as well as decision-making skills. Another thing I might add is that these bars um, can often be redrawn. Notice I've got a little bit of extra bar right here. This is for rethinking. When one looks at this, one may find out, well, they're real happy with the importance of this line and this line. However, in if we look and compare these two lines with this one, we think this one should be a little bit longer, so we're able to expend, extend that importance out to 110% or so. So we're able to look at a much longer line. Again, it gives you the freedom to keep re-evaluating. Now, something which is interesting about importance bars is that you're able to add them up. You're able to get lengths of them and then look at certain things and see how important certain concepts are. Say, for instance, the importance bars of prevent overfishing and save jobs were the same length if you added them together as the importance bars which showed offer unrestricted recreational fishing and reduce government intervention. What would that suggest about your decision? Well, if both of those are the same length, you're giving equal importance to putting in some sort of government intervention and equal importance to having unrestricted non-managed resources. And so what this does is it gives you an area to re-examine what your goals and your options are. What I'd like to do is to advance somewhat and take you into a classroom activity. And this one works on household cleaning products. This, again, is taken from the decision-making book. And in this activity, Students will read about the differences and learn about the differences in different types of cleaning products. Not only will they read about them, which you've already done already, they'll also be able to gather data, gather information by looking at labels. They will also have a hands-on process experience where they're able to evaluate the different types of cleaning products. And once that is done, then they are able to make a decision on which of these products to use in their home. Okay, the procedure that one would follow. First is that students would read, define terms, create a prelim, prelim, uh, preliminary decision. I'll get that right. Uh, and their preliminary decision is based upon pretty much a surface understanding. Right now, you have a little bit more than that understanding. If we were in a classroom situation, it is this time that I would give out the background reading, which you've already done. And understand that this is going to be modified from the way I would present this in a classroom. Not only are the steps somewhat modified to fit this video workshop, but also some of the features as far as presenting the actual activity will be somewhat modified. Uh, the cleansing activity would normally stretch for a much longer time period, go under different constraints, as I'll mention later on. Uh, however, we're going to take a couple of shortcuts in that. 
just so that you get to experience what it is like to gather information first by reading and then by firsthand experimentation. So first, students read. Then they discuss the decision. Again, this is a preliminary abstract dis decision. Then they do a risk assessment. They evaluate the cleaners based upon the label information. Labels carry different amounts of information. So we have a risk assessment. In fact, for your risk assessment right now, Carrie, if I can borrow that for a second. What we've done is we've taken several labels from different cleaning products and reproduced them on a sheet of paper. What I would like you to do right now is working again with your partners, your table partners, is to look through here, and I'd like you to compare and contrast the safety and the contents and what other bits of information you can infer by reading these labels. OK, why don't you take a couple of minutes on that, please? Yeah, it's got a caution. Yeah, and uh, there's no caution. So here you have a here you have a major warning. Here you have you say warning. Yeah. Here it just says, "Hey, watch out." That it's the safest one to use because it can be ingested. Uh, and see this antibacterial. You know, one of the biggest problems is determining what these things really contain. How many of you know what well, that's, cloth in there? Well, this thing doesn't even tell you what it has in it. Okay, people. What I'd like to do is bring this this piece right now to closure. Uh, and in fact, just a couple of things. You've learned a little bit about these cleansers by just looking at their labels. Their labels have given you some information. Uh, Mia, your, your group up there has look, looked at those labels. What have you found? If there's one thing that, that you can tell us about the cleansing fluids or the, the cleaners, what, what can you tell us? Well, basically, um, by looking at them, the baking soda, which is the one that most people would put into their body or it's able to be put into the body has no kind of, I mean, very small warnings, you know, it would appear that it's not, you know, hazardous or harmful or, or anything like that. What about, uh, the, there was a cleaner in there that had a antibacterial, antibacterial agent. What do you think about antibacterial agents? Based on the reading, you know, it's almost, and I, I mean, why do we really need antibacterial, right. you know? Right, and, and it's a good question. Or is it something which sells right. real well? Right. And if it sells yeah. real well, yeah. maybe that's another well, thing that we're looking at with students, becoming an informed decision-making so they become an informed consumer. What you're doing in the decision-making process here is giving students a little bit more background, letting them read about stuff. Now, reading is one area which they can get background. Another area is an actual experimentation, and that's where we're going to go to right now. Uh, if you look at the sides of your tables, uh, there is a small bin. If you could put that bin out on your table, and the other papers, if you can just stack those together and just get them off there. You'll be performing a, an activity in which you'll be able to actually evaluate some of these cleansers that are here. As I mentioned before, we're going to be taking some liberties in the fact that this is a video workshop presentation, you do not have eye gear in the classroom. You would have eye gear. We would also have a slightly different setup. We would also run this as an evaluation where the students then get to develop the line of inquiry, where they're able to say, well, if I'm going to test products, I am going to build these products in to the inquiry itself and then develop my own way of evaluating. All right, what you'll find in your little bin or a few things. You're going to find some different types of cleaning liquids, glass cleaner, and soaps. If you can please take out the small cups that are there. These cups are labeled BS, standing for baking soda, V, <laughs> baking soda, V, standing for vinegar, S, for soap, and GC for glass cleaner. Now you also have at your table a tile. And in your little bin, you've got some fun stuff. You get to be an eighth grader right now. You've got crayons and you've got a tile. All along you've learned, don't draw on the tiles. However, now what I'd like you to do is to Use your crayons, draw some images in the four quadrants. So if you can divide that tile up into four different areas and just to mark it with some crayons, um, 
that is what our first step. You could be as creative as you'd like. You can sign your name. You can rub them real hard. Some of them may be need, needed to rub it. But what I'd like you to do is just to mark up that. Think. Go ahead and divide it up, yeah. So I don't infringe on your space. There he is. <laughs> And then the other one just right gone. I guess we're going like right away. We have an arena on which to test different cleaning products. Notice that in your bin you've got a couple of other things. You have gloves. So we have gloves that I would like you to wear. I believe there's two pairs of gloves, which mean that two people within each group are going to be able to do the actual testing. So if you can put on those latex gloves, notice we have small squares of sponges that are also within your bin. And we have different types of solutions. We have glass cleaner, vinegar. You can dilute that out with some water if you'd like, some soap. And what I would like you to do is to evaluate those cleaners. How well can those cleaners remove crayon? Can they remove crayon? Is one better than another? Now, notice that the evaluation may depend upon many more things on other than how well they work. We're going to want to look at other concepts, but I'll talk about that in a second. Right now, you can mix them, yeah. But we can do all of them and keep all the variables the same, and then rank them. OK, that'll work. All right. right, and that would be the thing, obviously, when you're doing the setup within the classroom, the kids have to set up what the controlled experiment is. So the variables, so they're only looking at one. That's As you said right. before, the thickness of the crayon is going to yeah. make a difference. The colors probably make a difference. It'll come off, but I mean, you're putting a lot of, it didn't have that much on there. You're putting a lot of pores. So what did you mix? Baking soda and vinegar. And vinegar. But all you can come out with is the salt and water. So. Uh, but, but that's yes. very thick. Now that you've finished th this little bit of experimentation, again, to remind you, this is not the way that we would have done it uh, with the kids if they were specifically working on evaluating cleansers, but it's enough for you to get an idea of what the background of physical process is to the decision-making process. Let's take a look. What did you learn? Did you find that some of the cleansers were better than others, that some of them didn't require as much effort? Mia, yours, your group, what did, what did you guys find out? Um, we basically found out that the baking soda worked better than, than the rest. And the other ones would basically get it off, but it took a little bit more effort. And we also um, concluded that the orange crayon was the hardest to remove. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, did anybody find that the baking soda turned out to be the best type of cleaner? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody find yeah. something else? That, that was good? Vinegar. Vinegar. You found, somebody else found vinegar. vinegar. Interesting concepts. Yet in the stores, when one goes to buy a, you know, make a decision on what sort of household cleaner they'll get, generally they go more towards the soaps, more towards the detergents. Why? Commercials, learning stuff. What about toxicity? What about warning labels? Again, these are other things that people bring into making their decisions on what to purchase. Now, if we were looking at certain things for purchasing, we're able to look at the importance bars again and now apply them to the household cleaners. Now, if we look at the importance bars and the goals of a good cleaner, we're going to look and make sure that a cleaner has to be effective. We would want something that was effective. We would want a cleanser that had a low health risk. We'd want a cleanser that was easy to use. And we'd want one exactly that was low cost. So these are all the goals that we would be looking at. Once we have those specific goals listed, then we're able to do an analysis and a graphic representation of them using the importance bars. Now looking at this, we have got to make a decision on which of these is the most important. Which one of these do you as a person think is the most important? You think effect how important is effectiveness? On a scale of 0 to 10. Ten. Ten. 10. I see people shaking their heads. Now, do you disagree on the number one concern, or do you disagree on the importance of 10? The number one number concern. Is that who you are? And Explain, what please. What, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to, do you have a real horrible mess that you've got to get up so effectiveness really matters? Or is this just general cleaning so baking soda works just fine? 
Okay, so we've the got circumstance matters. All right, so it's within situation. the context yeah. of how you're using it. Yeah. What about having a child? What about having one of your children do it? What are you, health, what's going to be your health number health one concern? Health, 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 health. The health. It's going to be health. Effectiveness, if that is indeed from zero to ten, where would you place health risk as that's a person? Equally important. It's All right, anybody important. feel that it's not equally important? No. Does anybody here use solvents to clean paint? and use other types of aromatic compounds that is kind of questionable health use. So is it as important or maybe it's not in some situations and maybe in other situations it's even more important than it should be? What I'm getting at is that there's no hardcore line on where we're able to do it. So let's say that it is equally as important. What about ease of use? How important is that when you compare it to the health risk? Seven? Like seven? Less? Yeah. Yeah. More than <laughs> half? You think it's half as important, yeah. ease of use? No, no. A little more than half. A little more than half. Okay, so we're going to say that this one then goes here. I'm just not Again, that strong. If we take the word ease of use, what are we using it for? So this gives these kids, uh, each group is going to come up with totally different uh, importance bars. Yeah. They're going to all come up. So then you could probably graft it after that. But ease of use, it depends on who's reading the term ease. Exactly. And if you have somebody that's got these huge biceps and you're asking them to, can you please scrub over here? All right. And they scrub through the material as to somebody else. Oh, I'll scrub it there. And kind of does one of those. What is ease of use? What does it all mean? Again, much of this um, is subjective. And it, it's subject to how the context of, of the words are used, how the whole experience is set up. But think about how critical, I mean, the kids have to think about this. Because if they're going to take ease of use and make that a high priority, they're going to have to defend that. But it and means support it. So they're going to define it. Right. They're going to have to, right. gonna have to say, well, this is what I mean by that. And then maybe that will change your mind about whether you think ease of use is a high priority or not. You know, so you get that discussion and you get that interaction and you get kids bringing their ideas and, and you know, you you really, there's a lot, there's a lot of critical thinking, problem solving that's going yeah. on in something just as simple as this. This system allows you to move away from the words like ease or something like that into quantifiable situations. And then you can defend that and make some decisions based on, you know, really what you think. And it allows people to look at it and see where your value system is mm -hmm. based on the, on the way you quantify. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, so, and that way it, it gives you, a, you know, a real good way to look at your own thoughts as well as somebody else's. Yeah, and, and don't forget the concept of also putting that length. We're actually measuring lengths and then adding them. You're able to almost quantify a whole bunch of abstract concepts and looking that together. I just want to move along a little bit and go into one more application of the decision making. And that was in the grids, which you looked at before. If we looked at certain goals and you had to select three goals, what would three of the most important goals for selecting a cleaner bee? Again, from the goal list that we had before. What would one of them? Effectiveness. Effectiveness. So we're going to give this one the big E. So effectiveness is over here, the big E. What else? Health. 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 And finally? Use. Use. Ease of use. Oh, just show of hands. How many people here think it's ease of use? How many people think it's cost? Think cost. Interesting concept. Oh, no. Right down the middle. Uh, so let's say uh, it's, uh, I think it was cost one. We're teachers, so we'll go with cost. So we'll go with cost. <laughs> All right, so we have cost is, is more important in looking at the certain goals. Option X, say we were looking at, and I'm just going to pick these up as baking soda versus a commercial cleanser. Any sort of one, not necessarily the ones that we've looked at here. Obviously, we're going to be able to make certain calls about this. Ease of use between baking soda and a commercial cleanser. Is baking soda easier to use than a commercial cleanser? Oh, oh excuse me, effectiveness. Is it as effective? Based on, what you, what you've learned, based on what you've learned, yes. Yeah. So we're, we're going to put a big check over here for the base baking soda, maybe a check plus, and maybe only a check for commercial cleanser for right now. What about health? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Based, on look, the based upon the labels plus, that you've looked plus. at from a whole bunch of different cleansers, we find that the baking soda wins out again. Mm -hmm. Check plus, and it says a check. What about cost? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cost, we, we've got another one here. What was that last one which I didn't add? Was that ease of use? Yeah. Yeah. What about ease of use? It was. No, 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 no way. Ah, so we, we may have something where it's not a runaway oh. decision here. And maybe we have two checks out there. Again, we can then 
it, actually Maybe talk a little bit more and quantify, talk about and qualify what our statements are all about. We can include more information on why we make certain selections due to whether that option meets the certain goals. Looking at the beginning, we've already gone through a workshop and we've come to the end. And with that end, I would like to bring this workshop to closure. I trust everybody enjoyed themselves and learned a little bit more about the decision-making process. But not only learned about the decision-making process for yourself, but how then to work with students and to convey the complexities of decision-making to them, ensuring that they become wise and effective decision-makers. Thank you very much. This how-to video is designed to provide a model for developing techniques that can be used for successful decision-making. These techniques can be applied to daily situations both in and out of the classroom and can provide the learner with lifelong skills. The four video telelessons and activities in this Enviro Tackle Box module were selected from the NSTA publication Decisions Based on Science and provide a vehicle to incorporate the skills learned in this video today. Well, I want to thank everybody here very much for coming to this session. I trust everybody. And, uh,